uh, yeah, so in addition to Dow Planet, I uh, make my living as a journalist and have for almost a quarter, li- a quarter of a century right now, which is a really super disturbing thing to hear come out of my own mouth. Um, and so I spend most of my time uh, talking at rooms of people like this or uh, listening to whoever is willing to explain whatever they're doing to me as well. Um, and so my journey to Web3 um, started with a project I did um, several years ago, in a way it's kind of a precursor to my involvement in Web3, and that was that I crowdsourced a science fiction novel uh, with some readers from CNET, and this is back in like 2015, 2016, uh, and I really wish I was able to do it with some of the Web3 tools that we have now because organizing in like just a Google Doc and a Facebook group was totally a nightmare. Um, but one other thing that uh, I learned as I've been kind of exploring in the Web3 space, in addition to wish- wishing I had those tools back then, is I see in Web3 and in DAOs the potential to solve a lot of the problems that journalism has. I don't think I need to explain what too many of these are. I think we're all familiar with clickbait uh, and the 24-hour news cycle. I don't know if people know what news deserts is, uh, but you can drive, for example, from where I live in Taos, New Mexico, and if you were to head due east for several hours, you'll go through a number of towns and none of those towns has any local media source at this point. They used to, within the last 20 years, they've had newspapers, but several of them is closed. That's an example of a news desert. Um, And so just kind of uh, a warning, everything that follows uh, is based on the premise that all of this is, is actually real, and it's stuff that I believe in terms of the potential of journalism and it's in terms of the pursuit of truth and being able to actually build a more informed society that can solve big problems. It's something that, um, you know, I've seen this potential realized throughout my career. But more importantly, when you, you know, visit other parts of the world where this potential really doesn't exist, uh, it it feels different. Uh, And with blockchain and Web3, I think we have the the opportunity to change that. So what I'm going to talk about really quick uh, is what I feel are four pillars of potential Web3 journalism moving forward. So this is not a roadmap. It's not step-by-step necessarily, but rather kind of what I think are the four best ideas I've come across in Web3 that can be applied to journalism for the better. Uh, So the first one, pretty simple, something anyone in a DAO is struggling with and uh, doing some cool innovation on right now. Just hanging around in DAOs as a mainstream journalist in the past seven months, I'm constantly looking around for other journalists from the traditional media (laughs) and seeing none. Uh, There's maybe a few, uh, but the reality is that Web3 and traditional journalism uh, don't know each other right now, and I think that's bad for all of us because it means that the majority of the news-consuming public doesn't really understand uh, Web3. Uh, and that's the first thing that needs to change. There are some places where this is starting to change, and uh, and I'm getting involved. These are basically places I'm getting involved with uh, because I've seen this potential. Uh, Journal DAO is, j- at this point, just a Discord server that I started with a handful of traditional media journalists, kind of a discussion group at this, at this point. Uh, DAO Planet, we know what that is. And uh, Bankless DAO, is, uh, I think, one of the most powerful onboarding tools for, for Web3 right now. So there, this is happening in places. Um, but this brings us to the second pillar, which is a little more involved, and that is the idea that with Web3, we can move media from an extractive to an expansive ecosystem. It's probably a phrase you may have heard before, extractive versus expansive. Uh, and But first, to understand how we can make that movement, we need to talk a little bit about how Web2 journalism, which is the world that I primarily work in, how that works. Um, and one way that it works is that you've probably heard that news breaks first on Twitter, and it's true. Um, your social content has value, news value. Sometimes, sometimes it does, it has no news value. 
Um, but the problem with this is that uh, all of that value that we all post for free on Instagram and Twitter and elsewhere, TikTok, whatever, is completely harvested uh, both by the Web2 platforms that we posted to and by reporters like me that make a living off of it. And here's just a really simple example. And I'm not talking about Elon Musk posting stuff and then, because this is actually a big chunk of my job, it's just following his Twitter feed. It's a, a bit of a joke that my agenda is his agenda. But um, here's, a, here's an example of what I'm talking about. Um, so this is uh, just a, an image of Comet Leonard from December. Uh, some of the what I cover is astronomy and space stuff. Uh, and so I simply uh, grabbed this really cool gift that an amateur astronomer uh, created with some really expensive equipment, and I grabbed it, uh, threw it in my story that you can see there on the right. And hey, uh, you know, Dr. Janetta, I think, was actually pretty psyched that uh, this was out there. In fact, I know that they were. Uh, but the fact is, uh, at the end of the day, uh, I got paid for this tweet. Twitter got paid for this tweet. The person that took the photo with the expensive equipment didn't get paid anything. And something just seems maybe a little bit off about that. So to recap really quick this concept, uh, let's just take a walk back through the different forms of uh, web-based media. So web one, uh, taking us back like 25 years. The way value flows in the Web 1 news ecosystem is from the publisher to the reader in terms of immediate access to information. That's what Web 1 gave us. That was the innovation. Uh, and on the back side, value flows from the reader to the publisher in terms of subscription revenue and eyeballs to sell to advertisers. This is an age-old business model, right? Things start to change with Web 2. Uh, suddenly, with the social media platforms, we have value flowing from the publisher to the reader in terms of access to information still. But now, uh, the, the, uh, anyone can be a publisher, and you've got that extra audience. Uh, and, and also, we all get that little hit of dopamine from likes or retweets or whatever. There's value in that. On the other side, uh, value flows from the reader back to the publisher in terms of not just those eyeballs, but now they're also collecting all of our personal data to sell to advertisers and elsewhere. Here's where we are right now. With Web3, the value can, has the potential to flow from the publisher to the reader in terms of contribution to the creation of valuable content, and from the reader back to the publisher in terms of contributions to the creation of valuable content. It's a model that seems a little different in my eyes. So summing that up, the old model, you got eyeballs and attention that are converted to fiat via advertising. That funds the creation of content to attract eyeballs and attention, generate profit. In this new model that I'm talking about and that many are out there already working to create, engagement drives the creation of content, and that drives more engagement, generating value for the public good in the process. And there's the key, the engagement and creation can be moderated, measured, and facilitated through tokens and smart contracts. So summing that up in a couple of other ways. So with Web3, we can be expansive rather than extractive. And Web3 is the potential of citizen journalism recognized and civic life revitalized. OK, so on to the third pillar. Um, you can put information on chain to unlock its power. Uh, a couple of examples of how this has already been done. The Associated Press, uh, in a kind of this is an experiment in 2020. Uh, they put election results uh, on chain with help of Chainlink, and they use that to settle prediction markets. Um, also, some other experiments that are in action or uh, have been tried. Poet was a uh, a token-based uh, system that allowed, among other things, allowed publishers to put their portfolio. Uh, on chain. Uh, Ocean Protocol is doing super cool stuff that some of you are probably familiar with in terms of putting data on chain, token gating it, and all other kinds of cool stuff. And then the decentralized science community, some of these folks are here, and I think they're actually beginning to build the models in terms of integrating information and data uh, with blockchain. And I think that what they're doing is a potential way, lead, potentially leading the way. Uh, so now to journalism, some examples of how facts on chain might work and it's kind of the potential that's there. For one thing, uh, it has, it has, it's an opportunity to make working with anonymous sources uh, a lot more uh, 
uh, secure and simple for journalists. And I don't know if uh, this is how many people are still concerned about deep fakes. It was a pretty big deal before we are all worried about COVID, uh, but I don't think the risk has gone away. Uh, so I can imagine some sort of system in which if a, a journalist does a, a video interview, that file can go on IPFS and, and be tied to a, a multi-sig or something like that. And uh, so then if a potential deep fake pop, pop, pops up, you have the original on chain to compare and contrast. Um, another simple example uh, of how this might work is you can see uh, a lot of stories uh, get, get uh, changed, corrected, uh, modified all the time. And it would be good to have a transparent and mutable record of all those changes. And I think that would help build back up uh, trust with, with journalists. Pillar four in the community that I'm discussing some of these things with, the first thing that came up that we should do is, of course, buy some local newspapers um, uh, crypto style. And so why not? Why would we do that? Um, I can imagine a lot of reasons in terms of uh, trying out new advertising models and new onboarding models uh, and just having a sandbox for journalists and media professionals to play with some of these ideas. Uh, and just taking it one step further, and then I'll let everyone go. Uh, if we put all these pillars together, I think this leads us to where my brain goes is DAOs as the new wire service. And I know some of the bankless folks are in here. And uh, when I spend time in bankless, uh, one of the first impressions I had as somebody new to DAOs was we've got all these people contributing from all over the world. If all these people happen to be journalists, we suddenly have the most powerful wire service in the world. And so hopefully if we get enough journalists onboarded, that's where we're headed. And that is, uh, that is it for me. This process, like I said earlier, can be a straight line or it can run in parallel. Um, and I'm just eager to see what anyone here might be willing to build. So that's it. Awesome. Appreciate it. Eric Mack, thank you very much, Eric.